Genesis scripture verse of scripture. Today we're going to talk about the scriptures testifying about Christ all throughout the Old Testament. Scriptures testifying about Christ all throughout the Old Testament, how the scriptures and Jesus said they testify of me. All right, I'm going to prove that the scriptures all throughout the Bible testify of me. Now, when Jesus said the scriptures testify of him, he meant the scriptures of the Old Testament because the canon of the New Testament had not yet been written and decided. So because of this, when he said the scriptures testify of me, he specifically meant all the scriptures that are contained in the canon of the Old Testament. We are going to prove and look at 12 of some of those scriptures that show Jesus Christ um, either foreshadowed or a type of Christ in the Old Testament, such as Moses, he's a type of Christ, or Christ being foreshadowed. All right, so these are some of 12 of my favorite uh, uh, types and shadows of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, but there are many more. We are just going to stop at 12 because this can go on for a long time, but we're again here to prove that the Old Testament does indeed talk about Christ and foreshadow him all throughout scripture. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Jesus Christ talking to the Pharisees. This is John 5 and 39. John 5 and 39. Now, he's telling them to search the scripture because in them you think you have life, but the scriptures are those very things that testify of me. Now, in the book of Matthew, we see a little foreshadowing of what's going to happen uh, with Jesus Christ. Well, the foreshadowing is actually going to be in the book of Genesis, but we're going to see an incident that happened where we have Herod, the king, uh, is going to kill the uh, children two years old and under. So we'll, we'll, we'll read this. All right. Uh, this is Matthew chapter uh, 2, verse 7. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them digitally what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. All right. Now, what he want to do is He's looking for Jesus. He heard a uh, prophecy uh, tale of a coming king. He don't want this person to replace him or he don't want to be uh, in competition with this coming king. So what he's trying to do, he's trying to destroy the child. He's trying to kill a baby. This is baby Jesus Christ. This is Christ as a child and the uh, manger. So he, where he went, he, he told the wise man, go to Bethlehem and come back, give me word so you can come and kill a child. we we'll look at verse 16. It says, then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceedingly wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently acquired of the wise men. All right. So in this time, travel took a long time. You're on foot. And, you know, he inquired at what time the star, you know, was, you know, the wise men seen the star. And obviously, this has been uh, a year or two later when the wise men didn't return to him and give him word because obviously they were told by God not to return back that way because God knows he's trying to destroy Jesus. So what happens here is he gets mad and he destroys all the babies two years old and under. Now, let's look and see this parallel in Exodus chapter 2 with Moses. Now, Moses is a type of Christ, right? Moses is a type of Christ. Why? Jesus came to deliver people out of bondage of sin, out of the bondage, and Moses came to deliver the people out of the bondage of Egypt, right? Deliver the Israelites out of the bondage of Egypt. And Jesus came to deliver the world out of the bondage of sin, all right? So, same thing. If Moses is the type of Christ. So, in Exodus chapter 1, we see this. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of one was Sapphira and the name of the other Pua. And he said, when you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then you shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. 
But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men, children alive. All right. Let's go down here. Uh, verse 21. And it came to pass because the midwives feared God that he made them houses. And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born, you shall cast into the river. And for every daughter, you shall save alive. All right. The midwives didn't do what he said. That's why the, uh, the verse in 21 was saying God made them houses because they feared him, not Pharaoh. So they didn't kill the baby's boy. So Pharaoh then got, got mad and said, OK, he charged all the people saying every son that is born, you shall cast him to the river and every daughter you shall save alive. So what is he trying to do? He's trying to destroy the children. He's trying to destroy the male children, uh, male babies here. Yeah, a foreshadowing of what happened in Later on with Christ in Matthew. All right, in the Gospels. All right, so it's clearly a foreshadowing of Christ. Uh, we have another one. Okay, let's go to Exodus chapter 17. And when we're there, verse 11, it says this. Right now, I should say this, they're having a fight, they're having a battle. The Israelites are battling Amalek. All right, they're having a battle with Amalek. And uh during this fight, Moses is there and he's been told to do something, a certain thing, in order to win the victory, in order to be victorious. Notice here, Moses has is told to do something in order to be victorious. We're gonna read what that is right here in verse 11. Okay, and when it came to pass, when Moses held up his hand, all right, and is that Israel prevailed. When Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands, now, oh, not two hands now, but Moses' hands were heavy. And they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands. The one on one side of Moses, you know, and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady unto the going down of the sun. What happened when his hands was up in the air? Well, they were they was victorious. What symbol did Moses uh, look like when he's up? Well, let me help you out. They had one person on one side of Moses. And I noticed my arm's probably off the screen, but you, you can see what I'm doing here. And he had one arm this way. And as long as he did this, the Israelites were victorious. Again, a, a symbol of something that was going to happen in the future of victory. All right. Christian victory, a symbol that you see all the time now of people that believe in the Messiah. Something that he did that gave a victory over death, over Satan, over wickedness. Okay? That, that, that was Moses did. So what that was was foreshadowing of something to happen in the future. Again, what Jesus said, the scriptures testify of me. Let's keep going. Daniel chapter 3. <clears throat> Verse 25. We're going to talk about these three Hebrew boys, all right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What did they do? They refused to bow down to an image that King Nebuchadnezzar set up, all right? And he said he's going to play all this music and then and, and sounds and flutes and harps and dulcibers and all this other stuff. And these boys said, look, we ain't going to, oh, King, we're not going to bow down to no image. All the people uh, um, going to do that is those that do not have a true and living God like we have. Now, we have a true and living God, and him all alone are we going to serve. So this made the king mad, Nebuchadnezzar, and we're going to see here <clears throat> what's the outcome of all this. All right. <clears throat> Daniel chapter 3 and verse 25. Now, again, I explain what's going on right here, and we're going to see... Uh, the outcome of what happened. So I'm starting verse 23, actually, and it says this. These three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace, they were cast into the fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, true, O king, he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose. Now, wait a minute. 
Ain't what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that's three men down there. He says, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. All right. Foreshadowing. What did Jesus come to do? Well, to, to give us life and let us have it more abundantly. All right. To uh, save us from our sins. All right. Also, to save us from the wrath of God. What is the wrath of God? A burning, fiery hell. He come to save the faithful from a burning, fiery hell. So you see Jesus down here. You see the Messiah down here. You see the Son of God down here saving the faithful from a fate of a burning, fiery furnace. Now, foreshadowing of something to happen in the future. You read the scriptures and they testify of me. Right here, you see him doing what he always does and what always will do. Save the faithful from destruction. All right, now, you see that they have no hurt. All right, so let's go further. Let's go to the Gospel of John, <clears throat> chapter one. Uh, here we got John the Baptist, all right? He's gonna see the Messiah and they're gonna say something that's gonna give us a little foreshadowing, all right? I know we're in the New Testament, it's gonna give us a little foreshadowing of something about Jesus Christ. When we go back in the Old Testament, we're gonna make the connection or why this was foreshadowing, uh, this is fulfillment of something foreshadowed in the Old Testament, right? The next day, John said Jesus coming, John the Baptist, seeing Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. All right. And it's not the only place where Jesus is called the Lamb of God. Why do you think Jesus was called the Lamb of God? Well, we got to go back in the Old Testament and see what was foreshadowing this all along. What incidents, what things were done to foreshadow this? Well, let me introduce to you the Day of Atonement and something we call the scapegoat. All right, the Day of Atonement and what we call the scapegoat. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 16. <clears throat> and we're going to start in verse 6. Talk about these two goats. As a matter of fact, it's not only the scapegoat, God, uh, Jesus represents and is foreshadowed by both goats. There's two goats, All right? Let me see if I can get the meat of this here. All right. Leviticus chapter 16, uh, starting in verse 5. And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two goats, who? The priest, high priest, two kids of the goats for a sin offering, and one ram for a burnt offering. And Aaron shall offer, Aaron, the high priest, shall offer his bullock for the sin offering. That's for himself, right? I mean, these, these priests weren't like Jesus. They, they had sins they had to uh, atone for for their own self before they could offer the sins for the people, or offer a, a, a sacrifice for the people, right? So Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself and for his house, all right? This is for Aaron, all right? That, that's the bull. Now, let's get to the goats. And he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord, the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be a scapegoat shall be presented before alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. All right. So what we got here, you got two goats. Okay. You got one goat. They're going to cast lots for the goats. One goat is going to be slain. His blood is going to be shed for the sins of the people. You got the other goat who he's going to lay his hands upon the, the head of the goat. I believe that's in verse uh, 21. Uh, he's going to lay his hands on the head of the goat. And he's going to let that goat, uh, he's going to uh, place the sins of the people on the goat. And the goat is going to carry the sins of the people away. Okay. Now, Jesus is both goats in, in, in this illustration because Jesus is the person who died and was slain for the sins of the world. And he's also the person who carried our sins away. All right. Scapegoat carried the sins away. First goat was slain. All right. He was slain and he carried our sins away. Jesus foreshadowing the scriptures. Now, this is the day of atonement when this happened. One day a year, right? Let me read verse 21 while we're here. We're going to move on. 
The scriptures have always testified of Jesus. Jesus is all throughout these scriptures, right? Now, verse 21, and Aaron shall lay both hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon what? The head of the goat and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness, all right? The goat is gonna carry the sins away. What did John say? Behold, the Lamb of God who carries away the sins of the world. Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. Really hope you're getting something from this. Okay. Here we go. Jesus talking. For as Jonas, talking about Jonah, right? What did Jonah do? Well, we, we all know what Jonah did. It's going to explain right now. It says, whereas Jonah, Jonas, was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. This here is a direct apples to apples comparison between something that happened in the Old Testament scripture and something that's gonna happen to Christ. He says, just like Jonah was three days and three nights in the well belly, so is Jesus Christ, so, is, so am I gonna be in the heart of the earth, in that borrowed tomb. So this, this, this scripture, it, 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 it just open and shut, uh, open and shut case where he, he makes a direct comparison to something in the Old Testament that was a foreshadowing of something that was gonna happen to him. Okay, now, First Corinthians chapter 3, 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God? Who? Believers. Who, who are the temple of God? Believers. We are the temple of God. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, All right? And that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Who? The Spirit of God dwelleth in who? Us. Who is us? The believer. And the believer is the temple of God. Where does the spirit of God dwell? Inside of us, which are the temple of God. Where is this shown? Now, this is the uh, reality of it. Where is it foreshadowed? All right? Well, let's go to yeah, uh, First Kings chapter 8. We're going to back up. We're going to get to meet of this story. I don't want to start in the verse that we need. So, we're going to do First Kings chapter 8. We're starting verse 1. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the chief of the fathers of the children of Israel unto King Solomon in Jerusalem, that they might bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. And all the men of Israel assembled themselves unto the King Solomon at the feast in the month of, at the feast in the month Ethanim, which is the seventh month. All right, now, verse 10, and it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place that the cloud, that's the uh, Lord himself, that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. Then spake Solomon, the Lord said that he would dwell in the thick darkness. I have surely built thee a house and house to dwell in, a settled place for thee to abide in forever. And the king turned his face about and blessed all the congregation of Israel. And the congregation of Israel stood and he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which spake with his mouth unto David my father and have with his hand fulfilled this saying, Since the day that I brought forth my people Israel out of Egypt, I chose no city out of all the tribes of Israel to build in house that my name might be therein. But I chose David to be over my people Israel. And it was in the heart of David, my father to build in house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. Now notice here, the presence of the Lord that temple, right? That's what the smoke was representing. So they dedicated the temple, the presence of the Lord filled it. We are the temple of, of God, God fills us, right? Same thing, apples to apples. 
Here we go. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 12, starting in verse 3. Here we go. Now, this is what we call the Passover. This is where the Passover comes in. And again, it is foreshadowing. Scripture says plainly, <laughs> the scriptures testify of me. Speaking of Christ. So this says, speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take of them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your account for the lamb. All right. So if you have a household full of people, one lamb for you. If you have a house full of few people, you and your neighbor get together. He has a few people. You all share that lamb. Why? Because this lamb should be, it needs to be devoured. But that's not the only thing I'm going to do with the lamb. Let's keep reading. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. All right. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs, and they, bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Now, we want to go back and look at this doorpost stuff. Okay, verse 13. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague will not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Now, He's going to come through and kill all the firstborn. What's going to stop him from going in and entering and killing people inside that residence? When he sees the blood. And I'm here to tell you that's foreshadowing. Jesus Christ is the lamb. Who did, what did they slay? They slayed the lamb. Foreshadowing of Christ. They slayed the lamb. And when God sees the blood upon the household, upon the people, over the doorpost, he passed by. He does not deal with them. He does not kill them. He saves them alive. What saves us? It's the blood. Believers, it's the blood that saves us. The blood of what? The lamb that saves us. Foreshadowing. Again, the scriptures clearly testify of Christ. Now here in Numbers, we're going to see two. We're going to see two foreshadowings of Christ, two types of Christ, uh, back to back, all in one scripture. So we're going to go to Numbers, the book of Numbers, um, chapter 20. And we're going to see something here, foreshadowing of Christ. The book of Numbers, chapter 20, I'm going to start in verse 1. Here we go. Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, unto the desert of Zin in the first month. And the people abode at Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. And there was no water for the congregation, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. Now they're mad. They, they thirsty, and they mad, and they, they mad at Moses, and they mad at Aaron. And the people showed with Moses and spake, saying, With God that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. All right, he said, we, 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 we wish we were dead. They said, we tell, they tell him, we wish we were dead. It was better than being thirsty out here. Now, uh, verse 6. And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they fell upon their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and they shall give forth his water. And thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock, so that thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. All right. So if you see there, he says, you're going to give them water out of a rock. Okay. Now, I want to guess who the rock is that's going to give refreshment, that's going to give water. And this is foreshadowing, right? You guessed it, Jesus Christ. He's the rock of our salvation. But 
All right, and he's gonna give us refreshments of water, but there's something else there I want I want I want you to see. All right. Uh, uh, let me see if I can find it. Now let's go to verse ten. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto them, Here now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smoked the rock twice, and the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. Now, I want you to notice here in this um, portion of scripture, God is setting up foreshadowing for the coming Messiah. How many times was Jesus smitten? When I say smitten, you can say smite when you say hit something, and you can say smite when you say kill. The word smite is used in both the situations. When I kill somebody, I, I, I smoked them. Oh, he was smitten, right? Or you can hit somebody and I smoked them, all right? He was smitten, right? But this is a figurative of Jesus Christ being killed one time. He was only killed one time. Now, he had uh, 39 lashes with the, the cat of nine tails uh, when they were beating him. No, this might is one. So why did God get mad? He hit the rock twice. He told him to hit it once. God told Moses to hit the rock. Why? He messed up the illustration of the coming Messiah who's going to be smitten one time. On the cross for our sin. Not only that, it says uh, that the people got hungry and God had to rain out manna from heaven. Right? And the manna means what is it? You know, they, they seen this, this stuff falling from heaven, it was bread of heaven. So, uh, again, a type of Christ. What, what, why bread? Well, the Bible says, right, when we talk about bread from heaven in John 6 and 51. I am the bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. All right. He says, you know, he says plainly that I am the bread. He goes back to that illustration, that foreshadowing of Christ. He said, I am the bread that fell down from heaven. But well, he's talking about that manna that fell down from heaven. So not only that, let's, let's, let's look at something else. In John, back up to John chapter 4. We're going to go back and I'm going to show you how Jesus Christ is the water as well. Okay. John chapter 4, and we're going to go to verse 12. All right. Uh, John chapter 4, verse 7. There come a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, give me to drink. Now that he said, he said they had a well. He told her what? He told the woman, give me something to drink. For the disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then said the woman of Samaria unto him, how is it that thou being a Jew, ask a drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? And Jews and Samaritans don't have any dealing with each other, okay? And well, the scripture is going to tell you <laughs> very, very nice, very nice portion says, for the Jews, have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knowest the gift of God and who it is that say to thee, Give me to drink, thou would have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman said unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank there of himself? and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. Jesus is talking about himself. He is the water. That when you, when you drink of him, you will never thirst again. He's the water of life. Right? So, again, the water that come out that rock, foreshadowing of something else. It's a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. Again, the scriptures testify of me. Look at the Gospel of Mark. You're going to see something else. Yeah. Gospel of Mark, chapter 15, 
I'm gonna I'm 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 stay there for a second. We're gonna have a little discussion. That's the Mark chapter 15. Now, there's a very popular story in the Bible about a man named Joseph in Genesis. Joseph was a dreamer that dreamed a dream, told his brothers about it, and his brothers got jealous. And his dream was that he was gonna be second in command over uh, uh, everyone, over a whole nation. And his dream came to pass when he went to Egypt. Brothers dropped him in a, in a pit, sold him into slavery. He ended up becoming second in charge over all of Egypt. Now, two things here in this illustration, how Joseph is a type of Christ. First of all, he ended up saving the people because he made storehouses when they had a famine in the land. It, he made storehouses to save food and it, therewith, because he put the food in the storehouses, People came and all over the country that were starving, they had food to eat. So in that way, he kind of saved people from starvation. But the big takeaway is, and I'm first to um, talk about this, is his brothers dropped him in that well and sold him into slavery. His brothers betrayed him, right? Matter of fact, his brothers wanted to kill him. But, all right, it so happened that they had a second, uh, uh, they had a change of heart and what happened was Joseph was sold into slavery. And because of this, he ended up uh, becoming uh, what he became. Now, we, we talk about these things. What we need to find out, what we, what we need to look at is what happened to Jesus Christ. Okay. Who betrayed Joseph? His own kinfolk. Well, let's look at Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15, starting in verse 12. And Pilate answered and said again unto them, What will ye then that I should do unto him whom ye call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. Then Pilate said unto them, Why, what evil have you done? And they cried out the more, Exceedingly, Crucify him. And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. Okay. Now, question, who is yelling crucify him to Jesus? Who, 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 what did they say he was? The king of the Jews. It was the Jews, his own people that betrayed Jesus Christ. It was his own people that said crucify him. It was his own people that wanted him killed. And it was Joseph's own brethren that wanted him killed, that betrayed him. The scriptures testify of me. And not only that, did they fail in they, their uh, request? Now, obviously, in Jesus' case, you might say, well, they succeeded. He, he, he was killed. Well, he got up too. He rose again. He's not dead. He's alive. He's not dead, but he's a living and he's victorious. Right? So, in that respect, again, the scriptures testify of him. Last but not least, my uh, favorite example of uh, uh, foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. It, it, it can't get no uh, clearer than this. Uh, when you look at John 3.16, one of the most popular uh, scriptures in the Bible. And you know what it says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God so loved the world that he gave what? His only begotten son. So God the Father gave up God his Son for a sacrifice for what? The whole world, for humanity, right? So where, where do we see this foreshadow? Glad you asked. Okay. We're going to talk about Genesis uh, chapter 22, verse 1. We're going to talk about a man named Abraham, all right? Talk about a man named Abraham, and God asked him to do something that he himself would later on do with his own son. So Genesis chapter 22, verse 1 says this. And it came to pass after these things that God did tip Abraham and said unto him, Abraham. And he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. So he basically told Abraham, he said, Get up and go and offer your only son now. This is not his only son. 
he have Isaac, okay, the son that he's telling the offer, and he's had Israel. But Isaac is the son of promise, the son that he told Abraham that he's going to be a blessing to the world through, that he's going to get all his, uh, he's going to be the son that the blessings are going to flow through. So God tell him to offer this son, and he calls him your only son, Isaac. Yeah. What is this foreshadow? Jesus Christ. Again, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. The who said, believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He tempted Abraham in this way, and we all know what happened. When he got ready to get that knife strike down, God said, stop. Now I know how much you love me, that you will withhold nothing from me. And because of that, because of his faith, he became the father of a great nation and a uh, great, 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 great grandfather of the Messiah and a great man in the pages of biblical history. I hope you've been blessed by that and I hope you can see that John 5 and 39 rings true. The scriptures do very much testify of Christ. They testify in his words of me.